Yeah, thank you. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, online today. We've got a great service planned. Uh, we're in our second week of our Psalm series, and we're actually going to hear from Steve Andrews, uh, so we're really excited about that. So we're just about to get started again. Thanks for joining us.
Amen. Let's give a round of applause for Tatiana Schmidt. She is actually from Kensington's Birmingham campus, and that is an original by her. And it is so beautiful. I just love the way that it paints that picture of Psalm 23, which is our intention and our focus for this week. And his love is so overwhelming, isn't it? I just love the verse that we're going to hang out on uh, this week is Psalm 23, 4 and 5. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And basically what that says to me is that he is still our great shepherd. And he is our protector. I love, love that. Gosh. Now there's agreement with the lie that you've left me on my own. I'm not alone. I come out of agreement with the worry and the fear I've come to know. They won't have a hold on me. Protector, you never, never, never let me go. You say.
this over our lives. Well, good morning. Thanks for singing with us. Uh, my name is Greg. I'm part of the team here. Uh, just really excited for everyone who's gathered here today and a special welcome to those uh, who are watching online. We've got an amazing service uh, planned today. We're in our second week of our psalm series, and if you've been following along in the psalm devotional, um, the digital version, we have some print versions today. So um, even if you didn't start, you can always start uh, this Sunday, so be sure to grab one of these on your way out in the lobby. And also, um, we have, we're going to hear from Steve Andrews today down here in the corner. <laughs> Steve's excited about it. <laughs> if you haven't met Steve or heard, um, heard Steve uh, give a message before, he's one of our founding pastors at Kensington Church, and so we're just really excited uh, and honored to have him with us today. Uh, so, Summer vacation is almost over. I can't believe it. And September is nearly upon us. I know, right? We're crying about it. But um, we've got some great things coming up for kids and students that I want to put on your radar. The first one for students is coming up. It's called Ready, Set, Go. It's a, an awesome scavenger hunt, kind of road rally race kind of a thing that's going to happen. So if, uh, if you are a student, either in Breakaway, which is grades 6 through 8, or Edge 9 through 12, um, just really plan on being a part of this on September 11th. Um, so if you are a student or have one in your life, don't miss that great opportunity. And then for those have been, who have been participating in um, the park hangouts for K-Kids, we've got a couple more coming up in September and October. And so this next one is going to be on September 17th. So it's K-Kids painting in the park. Um, so I don't know if they're painting the park or just painting in the park. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I know if it's my kids, there might be more paint than just on the projects they are making. Uh, so it's going to be at Darrow Park. So be sure to uh, get all the info from K-Kids. We'd love to see you there. Well, if, if you've been in the service or watching online the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing from Craig Mays and talking about uh, where we're going as, uh, as a movement of Jesus followers, as Kensington Church, um, some of the exciting things coming up. But we also talked about uh, that it was time for our annual vote. And so, um, so if you call this place home, uh, you're a part of Kensington Church, we would love to hear from you. We'd love for you to participate in the vote. And so we're actually going to do it this morning, and it's uh, electronic. And so there's a few different ways uh, to vote this morning. So you can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash vote. You can follow that QR link. But when you do go um, on there, you can use the app. You can go to the website. Um, or if you're like, hey, I don't have a smartphone with me today or whatever, we're going to have a computer in the lobby so that you can 
you can vote. But the vote's only open from this, this morning, so I think it closes around uh, 1230. So uh, in that vote, you will see information about our budget, and you'll also see um, our upcoming elder team. And so what we're going to do is actually going to give you about three or four minutes here in the service because we want you to um, look up that info and check out all the details you'll see on the website there. Uh, it's very comprehensive. So uh, you can take a look at the, the budget and the elders and, um, and then vote and then we'll come back to get our service started. All right. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, just on behalf of like me and Joel, just we were really excited, but really grateful um, for you and the way that you partner with us to reach our communities and reach around the world. Um, being a part of this this movement of Kensington is really incredible, but it's only because of your great generosity um, to this place. And so we are just really looking forward to this next year and seeing how God will continue uh, to use us in our community and globally. So um, before we jump into the rest of our service, I would love to invite you to stand up and why don't you give a high five or a handshake to those around you. And uh, again, glad you're here. Hmm. 
Wow, it's, uh, it's so great to be here today. And, and I got to tell you, we've been working on this Psalm 23 series for a while. Craig Mays has put together this beautiful kind of devotional. And uh, I just got to ask a question. How many of you, when you think about Psalm 23, you think about a, a passage of the Bible that's been really important to you? Just curious, Psalm 23, how many of you really like you feel that, okay? There's a, there's a good number of us. Like this has been like a seminal message of God to me throughout my life. And I was thinking of it again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. That was last week. It was so beautifully done. Joel did a phenomenal job. Joel really wanted to be here today but he's pretending he has COVID at home. So Joel, if you're listening, uh, take care of yourself because 30 years from now, you might look like this, okay? So take care of your hair and, and live well. Okay, Ke Kelly, make sure he behaves himself. But it is wonderful to be here. I cannot tell you how much joy I feel. I just, I love, you're beautiful. You're beautiful people and God is, doing such beautiful things. In fact, this morning I got here about 8.30, Paul and I got up at 4 and had a leisurely drive up. And, uh, but it was just beautiful watching the sun break. And so I was just sitting here and then the prayer team grabbed me and took me back to the prayer room and prayed over me. And it was just, it was incredible. I just so appreciate that. And so today, in the second part of this three weeks, we're in the middle section of Psalm 23, it's the part we don't want. It's the, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. This is the part of this that where if you could avoid it at all costs, you would. And yet, it's unavoidable. It's part of what it means to be human, part of what it means to, to be alive and to step into this moment. And so today, Lisa and Bryce and the team are going to take us just for the next few minutes through an experience where as a church, as families, as individuals, as communities, these are moments, how do we respond when we're knocked down? And I just want you to just lean in with us as we prepare to hear from God through, through poetry, through music, and through the Word of God. To walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe the valley is the hardest season of your life when you are knocked down by devastating loss. Maybe it's not one season, but the whole way around the calendar again and again. As you struggle to put one foot in front of the other, desperate to emerge from the darkness. In the valley... I am vulnerable. Predators wait, militaries ambush, landslides bury. Even my own thoughts stalk and attack. The shadows play out my regrets of the past and my fears of the future. In the valley, I'm alone. Not the kind of alone of wide spaces with growing green things and sweet breezes but the kind of alone that's suffocating. Closed in by sharp, craggy walls of stone. How can I bear this valley alone? In the valley, I'm in darkness. Darkness that obscures all I seek, all I see. It hides my next step my own hand in front of my face, my destination. Has the dark swallowed the light? Is the sun still shining? In the valley, I'm exhausted. Bone weary and beyond, soul weary. 
Even my cells strained with the effort to take another step on trembling legs, waiting for the worn out collapse of it all. I'm tired, I'm worn, my heart is heavy from the work. It takes to keep on breathing. I've made mistakes. I've let my hope fall. My soul feels crushed by the weight of this world. And I know that you can give me rest So I cry out with all that I have left Let me see redemption win Let me know the struggle ends You can melt the heart that's frail and torn I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life all that's dead inside can be reborn cause I want I know I need to lift my eyes up, but I'm too weak. Life just won't let it up, and I know that you can give me rest. So I cry out with all that I have left. Let me see redemption win Let me know the struggle ends You can mend the heart that's frail and torn I want to know a song can rise From the ashes of a broken life All that's dead inside can be reborn I warm my prayers are wearing thin. I warm even before the day begins. I warm. only speak for myself this morning to say that that song really <clears throat> really resonates with me think of those moments in our lives when we're really tired and we've fought hard you know and we've we've loved and we've and we've experienced the disappointments and the brokenness of this journey and i just think it's beautiful to be able to be so honest with God, you know, I, I grew up in a wonderful church with so many wonderful people. But the one thing we weren't allowed to do was kind of be real. You know, to be able to walk in on a Sunday morning or to walk into our small group or even in our homes just to say, I'm worn. I love this verse. It says, I know I need to lift my eyes up, but I'm too weak. And life just won't let up, and I know that you can give me rest. So I cry out with all that I have left. And I thought, whatever you have left, 
Like even if it's just a breath, this is what Jesus invites us to cry out with. Like if that's, if all you got is a whisper to him, that's a, that's a cry. It's a beautiful thing to be able to express that. That's what David was writing in Psalm 23 when he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's an interesting thought. We'll come back to that. But you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Here's what you don't think of. Again, and Joel did such a, Joel, Joel is doing such a great job. And last week, I love the, he was just helping us identify David. But imagine King David as a shepherd boy to the time that he eventually became king and the amount of death that he saw, the amount of conflict, the amount of darkness, this, uh, th this whole experience of living in the, in the En Gedi, in the wilderness of En Gedi, which I've taken a lot of Kensington people to through the years, and you realize he's just up in the wilderness, and he's, but he's still finding comfort from God. And I love the contrast I love the contrast of the green pastures of last week, the still waters, and realizing that that was the moments of quiet when God can really pour into us. But now we have these times where life doesn't cooperate. And you have all the brokenness and the failures of your life to deal with. No one escapes this stuff. Vocational challenges, relationship struggles, financial pressures, and the list goes on and on. But as we look at Psalm 23, we see God inviting us to this place of beauty and rest. And then he says, and not only the place of beauty and rest, but I'm going I'm to I'm go with you in the darkness. And there's something that I want you to see here that I'm really excited to share with you. But before we do that, I want to receive our offering. Because the last two times I've been here, I forgot to do it when I was supposed to. And they said, if I keep forgetting, they won't let me come back. So uh, you can see it on the screen. There's different ways to give uh, to what God is doing. And um, if you didn't listen to last week's message, I loved where Joel highlighted just some of the really cool things that are happening locally as churches are coming together in partnership and serving and working together. It was really cool to see. And so you can, uh, some of you, you might even still have a checkbook. That's the last one. Uh, I just think that's funny. Think about how archaic that sounds like. But the truth of it is, God is moving in beautiful ways, and I love to celebrate that. I'm so excited for Craig Mays and Craig McGlasson to be stepping onto the elder board this year. Uh, Craig McGlasson has been doing a super job, too, and uh, just very excited for our team. So uh, thank you for giving and being in partnership with us for that. So I want to just give you three thoughts about in the, in, in the broken places of our lives, in the places where where it's the shadow of death that's, that's, that's waiting for us. Um, because it's, it's waiting for everybody. I was talking with Keith, one of our greeters, and he was talking about losing his son this year, and I just thought the unimaginable pain of how do you meet God in these places, and yet all of us live there. And so listen again. There's a shift in, this, in, the, in the psalm. Because remember in the first part, it says the Lord... It's so my shepherd, do that. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. There's a shift in the pronoun. Now he says, you are with me. First of all, God is he or him. I'm like, the Lord is with me. It's, a, it's, the, it's the first pronoun. Now it's the second person. It's you are with me. You're with me. The peace that God gives is saying, I'm going to be with you in the valley. There's no place you can go that I won't walk there with you. David goes from talking about God to talking to God. Lord, you're with me in this journey. So the psalm begins with David imagining the comfort and the security of the shepherd, and then the darkness rolls in, and he finds himself in this difficult place. He's alive, but he can feel death everywhere around him. And yet he's discovered in this place, the good shepherd's still there. 
Only this time, not so much leading the way, but in a sense, coming alongside. It's interesting, a lot of you have seen this. If some of you, uh, most of you probably haven't, but especially in third world countries like India, Nepal, and Africa, when you see people leading, moving goats from one area to the other, do you know how they move goats? The goat herders are always behind the goats, kind of trying to pin them in and move them towards a destination. If you get out in front of the goats, goats just wander off wherever they are. The only way you move goats is you have sticks, and from behind you whack them on the butt. A lot of goats in this room. <laughs> like sometimes the only leadership I could get God to do, you know, for me is hit me from behind. You know, come on. But, but shepherds are totally different. Shepherds will have, a, will have their rod and their staff, whatever, but they, they lead from the front. The sheep follow. It's a totally different experience. And so when it talks about the Lord is my shepherd, you're like, I'm following the Lord through the journey of life. But when you get to this place of darkness, I think it's more of like you're not just leading me, but now you're right beside me. You're like when it's, when it's terrifying to take the next step. It's interesting. Um, I've spent a lot of the, this last year with my mom. My mom, if she makes it, will be 97 on Oct October 7th, six weeks from now. But the last few months, she's really failing. Her heart's failing, and now she's moving into renal failure. And she's an amazing human being. But it's interesting, this summer, while I spent about half my summer in Memphis, pa Paul and I have been down there just helping just be with her and helping care for her. I noticed uh, July 4th weekend was one of the first times in my life that I felt a flicker of fear from my mom. Not so much the flicker of dying, but the flicker of what if I can't walk from my bed to the bathroom anymore? What, what happens at that, that point that every, every human being dreads when you are going to be locked, locked in a bed for a period of time? So it's not the dying, it, it's not the being dead, it's not the going to be in the presence of the Lord, but it's those last really hard moments. And it's so funny, because I had never seen that flicker of fear in my mom, ever. And my mom's lived an incredible life. In fact, let me, this was a, she spoke at a women's conference last year. That's my mom at 95 and a half. Is she gorgeous? Like, could she have given some of that to me? She was very selfish with the good looks. And I was thinking of my mom. If you look at this picture, think of a woman with 28 grandchildren, 85 great-grandchildren, five great-great-grandchildren, an unbelievable life of ministry and love for people. In fact, I'm 66 years old, and I was thinking I couldn't even think I was trying to think of something to complain about that my mother did, and I finally found something. I have a picture. She dressed me up like little Lord Fauntleroy. <laughs> Do you realize the trauma that I've experienced my whole life from having to wear an outfit like this? Uh, it's funny. I have a lot of pictures of me like that, um, but... I don't ever remember seeing this picture. My si sister sent this to me last week. And I, uh, I'm the youngest of five, but my sister Nancy and I were so close. And I was thinking of Psalm 23. It says, you're with me. You're with me in the darkest moments of my life. And I, it's funny, I remember, and I think back with my mom, in all my life, never ever feeling fear once if I was with her. Like she was a picture of the presence of what the good shepherd is. And all of you have people in your life like that. People that when you're with them, you feel safe. You know that you're not going to be alone in the darkness. And so now, as my mom is facing these stormy times, at the end of her journey, she knows the Lord is with her in that way. And by the way, when you think about that picture, that was in uh, the, the late 50s. But I was thinking of my mom's life and incredible ups and downs. Think about this. My mom was born in 1925. In 1943, every single boy that she knew and had grown up with 
put on an army uniform and left this country and many of them never came back. Like her best friend, her very best friend's brother was killed on D-Day. My dad's uh, two best friends. In, in other words, she lived a life that none of us can even imagine. Where literally, imagine you're 18 years old and literally every guy you ever knew is gone and you don't know if they'll ever return or not. And so it's the valley of the shadow of death I thought she's lived with all her life. But what's so cool to me is that life with Jesus as the good shepherd is the same here at the end as it has been for her all the years of her life. Because Jesus invites us to live in both of these incredible places. I can't emphasize it enough that in, when, you're in the, when you're beside the calm waters, when you are living in those green pastures, you're learning to trust God, to experience his presence and his goodness in a regular daily way. Craig Mays calls it pasture time. And this is the foundation for the inevitable valleys that come. For the days and the weeks and the months when you're not in a green pasture, you're in rocky country and there's no grass and there's no forage and there's no water. Jesus saying, I am I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to be there at that place. That is such a powerful time to say, and in this place, there's no fear. There's no fear because you're with me. This is what Jesus kept saying to the disciples over and over again. It's what Jesus gave to his followers. Well, just, let's just live in some of the promises today. Look at, uh, look at Matthew 28, 20 on your screen. Jesus, at the very end of his life, as he's saying goodbye physically to his disciples, says, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm leaving you physically, but I'm not leaving you. He says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's like you could be at peace. Like I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. I was thinking of this. I was thinking of my mom. My mom has been getting together with a group of eight girls that she was in kindergarten with. And they have gotten together every month since kindergarten to share a meal together. And sometimes more than, more than once a month. And at 92, they were all still living. And they've literally shared their life journey. Like, they're like, they're like, I'm going to be with you. I'm, and they're totally supportive of each other. But in the last five years, six are gone. Uh, my mom and Peggy Jemison are probably going to be next. And my best friend, Ray Allen, his, his mother, Julia Allen, she, she's going to live to be 140 probably. <laughs> and I thought, but it's going to be so weird because sometimes, sometime soon, Julia will be the last. Mrs. Allen is going to be the last one. And you realize that as a human being, you can't fulfill the promise. People say, I have, I have people come to me that say, I just, they just don't think the offer of God's presence is that great. And I'm like, who else is going to, who said, I'm going to be with you to the very end of the world and can actually keep the promise? Because I could, I could say, hey, I'm going to be with you. My, my wife is sitting in, this, in the auditorium today, and I can say, honey, I'm going to be with you. But eventually, I'm going to break that promise, right? Or she's going to break that promise to me. Because that's, that's just how life breaks. But we have a shepherd who says, I'm with you every step of the way, and you can trust me in this journey. You can know that I'm with you every step of the way. Look at uh, David, uh, this story from David's life. Um, where David is in the wilderness being chased by Paul. Do you remember what, remember what Joel said last week? How long was David running from Saul? Does anybody remember? Seven years. Seven years, literally waking up every night, every morning, like on high alert, wondering if today was going to be your last. Saul was searching the wilderness with 3,000 young leaders, uh, warriors. Probably David was outnumbered. We know for a fact five to one at one point, 
But at this point, it was probably 10 to 1, 10 to 1. And it says here that uh, the Ziphites, they were part of a cultural group in that area, went up to Saul, who was king at Gibeah, and said, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Haresh on the hill of Hakalah, south of Jeshimon? We have a pretty good idea where that is. I've actually walked in that area. It's pretty cool. It says, Now, your majesty, come down whenever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for giving David into your hands. Like, David is hiding with a few hundred men in nowhere, and yet Saul literally cannot sleep at night because he's so jealous of David. He's so jealous of the praise that David got, that David delivered the people of Israel from the Philistines. Remember when he, when he, when he faced Goliath by running into the battle? So all of that took place. And so, so in this moment, Saul is out there, and he's leading the search with thousands of soldiers. And when you get to 1 Samuel 24... Uh, there's a point where I think you just wonder, the Bible's so real, but it says Saul had to use the bathroom. And I think it's too polite to say which number it was, but I think you can guess. Is that inappropriate? Yeah, I shouldn't even have said that. But so Saul is going into a cave. He's going in to have some privacy to use, to use, use the bathroom. And lo and behold... David is hiding in the cave. And David has some of his great warriors with him, hiding in the cave with him, and they're like, this is the moment. Like, we've been running from Saul, and God has brought him and placed him right in your hands. Look at 1 Samuel 24, 4. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I'll give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. It's incredible. They're like, I mean, listen, they've, they're away from their wives and their children, but they've been committed to David. These are David, the, the handful of men that, that came to fight for David. You can read about him. Uh, they were incredible warriors, but I'm sure they were tired. They were scared, and here was their moment. And so here's what David does. It says, he crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Which still is pretty incredible. He, I'd love to see the movie of this, but it's, it's probably never going to be made. But he gets up there, and David shows this restraint. And then later, David even regrets what he did. Look at, listen, look at what 1 Samuel goes on to say. It says, Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid. By the way, and when you see the, the word Lord in all caps, is it all caps on the screen? Yep. Remember, that's Yahweh. That's the most holy name for God. The, the uncreated one, the always was God. He said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed. He said, he said, yes, I'm anointed to be king, but God also anointed Saul, and I am not going to step in God's path. I'm not going to take God's will and, and take, it, take it into my own hands because Saul is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave and went his way. i got to tell you, where do we find people like this? People like, imagine someone has been your worst critic, and all of you have had critics. And let's say all of a sudden something happens, and that person is in trouble, and you can pile on. You can let them have it. You can say, I, I knew it, right? I just, and you can just enjoy it. You can revel in the gossip. You can get on. You can do whatever it is. It kind of feeds the, the flames of that. Or you could pray for the well-being of that person. You could refrain from piling on. You could forgive and let go of resentment, right? It's all the things that are so hard to do, but when God's comfort and peace is with you, you don't have to take life into your own hands because you know that you're not alone. David experienced God. He trusted him and rather 
He said, God, I'm not going to take control of the situation. I'm going to continue to trust you. That's why Psalm 23, when you hear that story, what he did with Saul, doesn't that make Psalm 23 more meaningful to you? He's like, the Lord's my shepherd. I don't, I don't have any need. Remember we talked about that last I shall not be in want. Like, God has given me everything I need. David is giving this verse in the middle of running for his life. He's running for his life. He says, with the Lord as my shepherd, I've got everything I need. Don't you want to live that way? As you face whatever's coming your way, that's how I want to live as I get older. You know, some of you got, no, I'm not old yet, but when I get old, that's how I want to live. Come on, that's funny. Not funny? <laughs> so, okay. So in this, in, in the valley, the shadow of death, there's God's peace, but there's also God's comfort. Look at what David says. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod, again, I want to, just want to re reiterate this for sheep. The rod is very rarely used on a sheep. They're just fragile. I was just in uh, South Africa, and I was looking. There were three or four different, uh, there's a Bonsmara cow, and then there's a special South African breed of sheep that are pretty hardy. But generally speaking, sheep are pretty vulnerable. It says the, the rod is often used to, to gather the sheep and to gather it into the arms. They said sometimes there's occasionally where a wayward sheep has, uh, is, is limited in some way. I've even heard that you would even like uh, uh, not necessarily break the leg, but sprain it in some way so that the sheep would be more, more pliable. But look at what David says again in Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip, and he who watches over you will not slumber. I think of this with my mom. My mom is, for years, but wakes, she wakes up, she has leg pain, she gets up three or four in the morning, and she just reads her Bible for hours before everybody else is awake. But I also think of two of my grandsons. I have two of my grandsons who were adopted, and I was thinking um, every single night they go to bed, they kind of settle in, but because of trauma in their life, Every morning, they wake up like this. Every morning, high alert, right? F fight or, or flee. And it's part of, the, part of the brokenness of their story. And one of the things when I read this passage, I thought there's a God, there's a God revealed in Jesus Christ who says, I will not let your foot slip and I will watch over you while you slumber. And I'll watch over you when you wake up every morning of your life. And your first reaction is panic. And I'm still watching over you. And I will never not watch over you. God's never taken a nap. He's never not watching. And I think of Psalm 121, as you guys who love to study the Bible, you go to Luke 15, where the parable of the lost sheep. Remember what the shepherd does? He leaves the 99. This is, was, was uh, for Kensington, for Bay Point. For, I remember Nick and I would talk about this. This always was the vision of what? It was the shepherd leaves the 99. He goes and he finds the one. Because the one is where? Somewhere up in the hills. Somewhere lost in a valley. Somewhere lost or broken. And the sheep is saying these words. The sheep is lifting their eyes up to the mountains. Where is my help? My help comes from the Lord. This is what God is asking us to do. There's a third component. I'm almost done. And that's care. Peace, comfort, and care. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup, 
overflows. What a picture for David. He was surrounded by enemies. The nation of Israel, all of their existence, has always been surrounded by enemies everywhere. And what he's saying that in this valley of death, he's not living a white-knuckle existence where you're just, you're just grabbing on, trying to protect your life. He said, no. I'm not going to live hanging by a thread. I'm going to thrive in the presence of God. I'm going to have an overflowing cup in the worst moments of my life. My life is going to be rich beyond measure, an experience of love, even when life is falling apart. So funny with my mom, and she's coming to the end. I just got a picture of last Sunday. She was in church Sunday. She's in a wheelchair now because her, her heart's not clearing the fluid out of her legs, but I got two or three pictures of her. One of them was with like 15 of her great-grandchildren having lunch after church on Sunday. Right? She's, I'm not, she's not white-knuckling it. She's thriving in the midst of saying, I want to thrive until God gives me my last breath. That's what the prayer team prayed over me this morning in the back room. They're like, to his last breath, give him that thriving of the presence of God. That's what God wants for every one of us. See, David felt so cared for by God, even with Saul and his massive army and all of the chaos. Inside David was this calm. And I was talking uh, again with Keith, one of the greeters this morning, and he, he told me that he starts every day off with Psalm 23. And I'm like, why don't I do that? I've, I, I've been starting to, I mean, I just, sometimes I start, start looking at the news. Like I've been kind of just like, I, I've been reading the Ukraine nuclear reactor every morning, you know, just filled with fear. I don't know, how about you, but just like, oh, God. That just would be horrible, wouldn't it? Render a whole section of planet Earth uninhabitable for who knows for how long. And just in the madness of what's happening, I thought, Lord, I don't want to white no, I want to trust you. I can't control that, but I can trust you. And here's what I want you to understand. For David, it was about Yahweh, right, as creator. But for us, as we get ready to just sing for five or ten minutes here at the end of this service, it's about Jesus is our shepherd. Psalm 23, David's thinking of God as creator, as redeemer of his life. But then Jesus in the New Testament, he goes, you know that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, guess what? You know what he's going to say in John 10. He says, I am the, the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. Why would I be afraid if I know Jesus is going to step into every situation with me? He's going to be with me. He's going to be before me. He's not like the hired hand who doesn't care for the sheep. You see, the hired hand sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away, right? The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because it's the hired hand. That's not what... Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. As we kind of finish this middle section of this series, I really want you to think about two things that are so pivotal that could change our lives. The first one is this. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're living in, are you living in the truth? that Jesus is your shepherd, like that you're okay. Is it cancer? Jesus says, I'm with you every step of the way. I want to be your shepherd. And if you've never consciously, here, anybody watching on stream, never consciously said, Jesus, I receive you as my good shepherd. Like, I know that you know, my, know me. You know everything about me. Just go back and read Psalm 139. You know everything about me. You made me. You love me. And you walk with me every step of the way. If you made him your good shepherd. The second is, and this is a really big one. The band can come out now. But the second question I want you to think about is, are you learning daily to hear his voice? Like, do you have a daily scripture practice where you just let some of the, the words of the Bible wash over you? Like, one of the things I've been doing for about 10 years is I get a 5 a.m. email every day from the Moravian Bible Society, and they in every every morning I try to I try to make it the first thing that I do when I wake up, 
is read the Old Testament and the New Testament scripture and then the prayer. It's really simple. It takes about a minute and a half. And that's, that's something I do every single day for the last 10 years. And sometimes I get to other more, more intense Bible readings or other preparation, but it's learning to say, am I learning to hear his voice? Because listen to what Jesus says. This is my last scripture. He says, the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. It's a beautiful thing when you're living life in a journey with someone that knows the voice of the shepherd. Whether it's my mom or whether it's my grandkids, hopefully learning that they're going to learn to hear the voice of the shepherd. Or sometimes listen, listening to you sing that song this morning, this morn, and, the, and, and Lisa reading the, reading the poem, it's like you guys took me into the presence of God by saying, God, this is how I feel, and I'm trusting you in this journey. And so let's pray together. Father, every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room, everyone watching on stream, I, I do seriously, I pray for Joel's quick and full recovery. But I also just would say, Lord, probably most of us are struggling to hear your voice in some area of our life. There's an area where maybe it's 10 areas, but we're concerned and we're wondering. We have people that we love, that we're, we're anxious about, that we're broken over. There's so many things, Lord, and I just want to say together as a body of people in the next few minutes as we sing together, as we say, Lord, you are our shepherd. We trust you. And we recognize that we live and we move and we step out into a Traverse City broader community where there are people that are afraid and concerned and feel an emptiness and a futility with their lives that they need to know that you are wanting to walk with them every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you for the experience of knowing that you're the good shepherd. You're never going to leave us. And we trust you. We do it together. We do it with our families, Lord. We want to walk with you knowing that we are never alone, that your peace, your comfort, and your care is with us. In Jesus' name.
hill called Calvary But for the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me Oh, I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way For the sun Yes. 
that our resurrected Savior is scarred. The wounds in his hands and his side and his brow. And there's, there's no valley that you're going to go through today or this week or this year or this lifetime that he hasn't already walked ahead of you and has returned to walk with you in this journey. And he is indeed our living hope. This is what we Enjoy and can rest in knowing that he is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need, right? Let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. God bless you. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. It's a wonderful, incredible group of people. Continue to bless and move through them and in them. Lord, we trust you. No matter the circumstances, our lives are in your hands. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.